Everybody. Welcome back to the Fitter and Faster Coaches Corner. As always, I'm your host, Mike Murray. Thrilled to be joined today by a fellow Fitter and Faster, big time elite clinician, <laughs> Atiba Wade. Always good to see Atiba on. Atiba, you have been putting out so much great content over the last couple months. You're doing some short bits with Brett Hawk on our social media platforms about some of the importance about developing good skills and habits as athletes. What you're most well known for is your work in strength and conditioning, specifically dry land training for swimmers. You're very passionate about this subject matter. You've had so many new and innovative ideas over the last few weeks. What's inspiring some of these new exercises and, and just how are you thinking about ways to make dry land more interesting and more fun for the athletes? Well, uh, the passion just comes from a passion for swimming. And the intention is actually to help to contribute to the evolution of the sport. One way that I'm trying to, or my intention uh, to help contribute to that evolution is through optimally tailored uh, strength and conditioning dry land work for swimmers that is athletically focused, but also swimmer specific. It's really great to see dry land exercises that anybody can tell are specifically designed for a stroke in the application directly to swimming. One thing that you've done that's made it really interesting is in addition to the video of you demonstrating some of these exercises, you actually have a screen and a screen, and above you is an athlete swimming uh, that stroke. And what the participants are able to deduce from watching this is, hey, this exercise directly correlates to what I'm doing in the pool in my butterfly. Why do you think that visual application is so important in this day and age to keep our athletes excited and engaged? Well, as you know, uh, coaching is an art and a science. Um, there is a science portion, but what these videos do, it helps actually for the coach and for the athlete. I'm, you have to kind of sell the science behind it. And when you see the actual stroke with the screen and screen shot of the actual exercise, it helps to sell the science. And when you were first putting these together, did that idea kind of come to you as, I know how to make this really easily applicable to coaches and teams. If they can see the exact reason why they're doing something, it's going to motivate them to really jump into this new exercise that they haven't seen before. Well, yeah, to be able to talk the talk and is one thing, but to be able to walk the walk is the other thing. So when you can actually bring those two worlds together. So if I'm speaking to you about it, uh, I'm not just, and once again, the art and the science, I'm not just talking about it. I can actually sell, sell the science behind it when I'm demonstrating uh, some of the moves and talking the athlete through it. And there is no disconnect. There is optimal, there is a maximum overlap for optimal effect. You're really bringing up some principles of kinesthetic awareness and athlete development in terms of building some athleticism. As coaches this day and age, we are constantly thinking of our swimmers as the whole athlete and not simply movement that is swimming specific. In addition to what you've done with the screen and screen and showing athletes that what they're doing on land applies directly to the water, you also incorporate in your other routines movements that help develop athleticism. Why is athleticism so important in the development of the contemporary swimmer? Well, as you can see, look at the swimmers nowadays. They look like uh, Caleb Dressel could step onto a football field, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, so when you're, when you're coaching and when you're performing, coaching and performance, in my mind, is synonymous with cause and effect. When you are performing, 
that's the effect. When you're coaching, that's the cause. Uh, coaches have have to have the mind, they have to have the eye to actually see the cause. Uh, when spectators or even parents, athletes, they look at the effect. Uh, coaches actually have to see the cause. And when you have, when you treat the swimmer as an overall athlete, um, you can really optimize effect. And in order to optimize effect, um, knowing what causes that jerk in your stroke or what causes you to fishtail uh, is, is key. And that's where that overall athleticism, athleticism uh, comes into play because speed is the name of the game. You wanna be able to pace yourself as an at when you're swimming and all that stuff, but speed is the name of the game. And that's a given. But you also, along with being able to swim at all out speed, you need to be able to race with all out technique. <laughs> There's a big difference. Uh, you see a lot of swimmers, myself, I've been guilty of this as well. I'm like, all right, I'm jacked up and I'm just spinning my wheels, uh, just trying to sprint through the water, but I'm not, I'm racing with all out speed, but I'm not racing with all out technique. And what the system that I'm working on, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm sharing with everyone, it really helps you to race with all out technique because you are, more kinesthetically aware, you do have more access and you are developing or correcting in order to optimize and enhance that core strength and core stability. For sure. And one thing that I know about your background and your journey through the sport, very similar to mine, back in the days where we were developing in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, we had such a background in aerobic training. You, of course, you swimming for the legendary Jim Ellis. Sometimes there was never enough he could do inside of two hours. I, I know because <laughs> I've seen the logbook. But what we're yeah. seeing now is real development of speed. One thing that I love that Coach Salo says all the time is he refers to his distance swimmers as his long sprinters. Yeah. That focus on speed has really changed the way we look at the sport. How have you viewed that transition over the last few years? Oh, that you can, it's the proof is in the pudding. Just look at the athletes that, that are coming up nowadays. Uh, you have an athlete like Reese Whitley, 6'9", but he could, just like Caleb Dressel, they could step onto any sports team and potentially be their starter. But as I said, this whole uh, being able to have a strong and stable core, being kinesthetically aware, uh, having that mobility, it allows you to race with all out technique, not just with all out speed, because as I said, speed is the given. We're all here for that. Everyone wants to get their hand on the wall faster, but uh, being able to race with all out technique is the key and having a strong, stable core, being able to be kinesthetically aware and also having that ability to be mobile in the water which is a totally different element. It's almost like an anti-element <laughs> because everything is counterintuitive when, uh, as opposed, when you're horizontal as opposed to being vertical, gravitational force versus drag force. The rules are totally different. So uh, we, we, the, common, the common denominator for any great athlete is a strong core, uh, but being able to have that mobility and kinesthetic awareness will help you to race with all out technique. I love the way that you talk about technique as it relates to the core. And our focus today is core strengthening and mobility and developing that type of program. The first thing that I think about when I watch an athlete's technique break down at the end of the race or in the last 15 or 25 meters of a race is that they, they've let go of their core, that they weren't able to maintain correct biomechanics because that core strength just isn't there yet. A lot of times when you see younger athletes try to increase their speed, they're doing it through their legs, which is what we want, but you're not going to have quickness in your legs and your feet if you don't have a strong core to work those muscles off of. So what yes. are some early considerations that coaches should think about when putting together their dry land programs for their athletes? I, I've said this to you. I've said this to a couple other people. We had Vern Gambetta on a few weeks ago, and I said to Vern, you know, Every year I hate my dry land program. <laughs> I, 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 get, I get so locked into doing a lot of the same things. And one thing that he reminded me of is that's not necessarily bad, but the way that the athletes are performing the dry land, do they have correct technique? Are you maintaining, helping them to maintain that, that movement? 
So if you're setting up a dry land program at TIBA for age groupers, ages 12 to 18, what, what are some important considerations coaches should think about when putting that program together? Well, first of all, there's three S's that I work with, and that is uh, making sure that the exercise is safe, making sure that it's scalable, and making sure that it is sustainable. If the exercise is not safe, it is 100% off the table. <laughs> Um, but when you're doing a certain exercise, we want you to be strong from point A to point Z, not just from A to B. And that's where the scalability comes in. Um, everyone's bringing something different to the table. Uh, some athletes, especially from those 12 to 18 year olds, uh, some may just do swimming. And because they only, swim, they only do one sport, they, they don't engage their body in the same way that someone who is a dancer and a gymnast that happens to swim the way they move their bodies will be different. So uh, being able to scale an exercise to where the athlete is uh, and, and you wanna juxtapose that to where you want them to go, you, ha you have to have, make sure that that exercise is scalable. So safe, and then it has to be scalable. The sustainability factor comes in uh, <laughs> because if you can only, we're not just doing a one rep max and then coming back, letting your body recover, you know, for a week, you want to be able to have something that you can do consistently, and that will help you to consistently improve, not just physically, but also you want to be able to create a more um, well-connected mind-body connection. So when you actually perform in the water, what you're doing on land has that optimal, uh, has maximum overlap for optimal effect. And when you get into the water and perform, it's automatic. You don't want to have to always have to just talk to your body all the time. You want it to be automatic. No doubt about it. And what we see a lot of the successful coaches at the club level doing right now, Atiba, is a lot of jumping exercises and a lot of crawling exercises. And, and those two exercises, no doubt, help with explosiveness and just being more athletic. But you're combining these now with exercises that are specific to the water. And I wonder if you wanted to share a few of those with us so that we can see some of that great screen and screen work that you've been doing. Sure, sure. And uh, when I'm doing and uh, jumping, that's interesting. When you're doing jumping exercises, just for if any coaches is, is uh, watching this right now and you're like, oh, jumping, yeah. Make sure that not only do you teach jumping, you have to teach landing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because you land as much as you jump and the force when you're coming down is so much greater. Uh, and particularly when we're working with swimmers and we are notoriously horrible when we're vertical. <laughs> Heavy feet. If you're, yeah, if you're working with a swimmer and you're teaching them how to jump, please teach them how to land. That's the safety portion that I'm talking about. All right, with that being said, <laughs> let's get to that video. Hold on. Let me pull this up here. Now, Atiba, I can tell you that with our team, we've started to incorporate this. And for my part, the athletes are much more engaged when they're doing something that they know is going to apply directly to their stroke. Oh, and it's fantastic when you're doing that, too, because it also gives you a sense of like you're in a tribe, you know, like this is our thing, you know. <laughs> so we'll start off with uh, just the dry fly that we've covered before. So as you can see with, uh, when we're doing dry fly here, you are really, ha you have to engage your core in a way that is similar to butterfly. You have to make sure that uh, it is firm and flexible. Uh, you have to stretch your arms forward, timing the breathing with the, uh, with the arm recovery. You have to have that core strength, core stability to propel your, propel your body forward, as you can see in that push-up. <laughs> I'll just rewind this really quickly. What I like there, Atiba, as I watch this is you have two variations of the dry fly. You have dry fly, which we see here, mm -hmm. and then we have the dry fly push-up. And I wonder if you could, for our coaches who are watching and listening, some are listening on Spotify, could you just tell us exactly what your movement is for the dry fly and then exactly what the movement is for the dry fly push-up? All right. Well, it's a combination of things. Like, for example, if you are familiar with yoga, uh, the it's partially um, locust position, 
and then I'm stretching my arms forward. And uh, so if you're if you're if you happen to do yoga with your swimmers, it's a combination of locust pose and uh, bring your arms forward for um, for to mimic the butterfly recovery. And oh, sorry, I keep scaling this. I mean, I have to keep going back and forth with this. I didn't have it looped. <laughs> so as I said, this is the scalable portion. If you are on, if your swimmers have trouble doing pushups, just work on the dry fly and just slow it down. And I'll just play it in slow motion. As you can see, my arms are stretching forward and my legs are lifting up. And I'm making sure that my core is strong and stable. And that allows for that transfer of force. That's what the core does. It transfers power through your upper and lower body. So you can just see just right there, I'm just bringing my arms forward, similar to butterfly. And just like in butterfly, uh, right in this portion, that is, as you can tell, my body is angled forward and I'm hitting my triceps in a manner that mimics the butterfly uh, finish after your pull. So boom, as you can see, Camille Adams right there, she's finishing her stroke, I'm finishing my stroke, or I'm finishing my pushup. Uh, that also, that's the scaled up version. So that's where the scalability comes in, but also as you can see with the recovery portion and uh, the timing portion, that's butterfly. And Atiba, you're actually incorporating a lot of movement inside of this exercise because in between the dry fly push-up and dry fly, your feet go from being dorsiflexed uh, and then you have your feet at plantar flexion just like you would in, in the dolphin kick. So there's a lot of uh, body literacy here that your athletes are going to go through while they do this. And though it looks like a very simple movement, it really addresses almost every part of butterfly. Yes, and uh, that's what and that's why we're doing it. So this is something that is safe, scalable, and uh, sustainable for swimmers to do, and it also just reinforces um, stroke mechanics while simultaneously helping with the swimmer's mobility, strength, and conditioning. Awesome, I yeah. love it. All right, so do you want to go to another one or just let's do it? All right. We'll go to side arches right here. No, I really enjoy this. That this. This has become a Victor Swim Club favorite. So <laughs> it's, uh, I was very fortunate to see these very early on. We've been doing these for about six months now. And I can see, you know, change happening in our kids understanding how to do this better. And it has translated to our athletes staying lower on the wall and getting in and out of their open turns much faster. Well, that's the intent right there. And uh, yeah, being able to scale it for swimmers, this is the open, obviously this is the, this is the open turn. And uh, that is a side plank, <laughs> as you can see, but also that's a turn, that's an open turn. Uh, your body is turned to the side and you're pushing off and you have to really stretch your body and the arm, as you can see, how it's going in my arm, how it's kind of going into the water. I'm not just trying to lift my head up <laughs> or drop my hips or spin around. I'm just uh, really getting into that side plank position, extending my body as if I would off the wall. And the next version, I'll just uh, go to the next exercise right here. This is the flip turn, backstroke or freestyle. And being able to, as you can see right there, I'm hitting the wall the same way. My body needs to have to make sure that my arms are in a, a nice tight streamline. As you see uh, Nick Thoman here, the way his arms are in streamline, his, his feet are placed optimally on the wall and um, I'm about to push off. So be, and being able to bring your legs around and into a tight ball and being able to move in a nice tight ball, like a ball bouncing off the wall, placing your feet, and then exploding off that wall, as you see in this next video right here. So, and uh, my main man, Clark, Tom Clark Smith, he's great. Uh, being able to flip and push off the wall with some power, being able to use that strength quickly, which is the definition of power, being able to use your strength quickly, um, pushing off into a nice extended body position. There is, uh, you can see that my, I'm not, there's no bending of the back, I'm in that nice stretched out position, ready to explode off the wall. 
Boom, I mean, push that, that is an incredibly athletic movement. I mean, you, you've done it so often and you're obviously an expert in the field. But what I notice when I watch you do that is everything is smooth, it's with finesse, but it's because that core is staying nice and tight throughout the other exercise. There's not a lot of extraneous movement. You are rolling right into that pike straight up. And I saw that you, you're you doing it with weights, but athletes could certainly do it without. Oh, you can do it. It's, challenging. it's super challenging to do it without weight. And you could do it with a med ball as well, weighted med ball, and that's fantastic as well. Um, but yeah, doing it without weights is also challenging. And um, you can also add a jump to that as well. You can jump right into streamline if you don't have the weight. But if you do have weight, you can do it with uh, jumping in the streamline. But once again, you need to make sure that you're being careful and uh, learning how to jump, but also learning how to land. <laughs> so what we just saw there was the um, side arch open turns. And mm -hmm. then you call it uh, the rock and roll. Oh, rock and roll streamline. Rock and roll streamline. Rock and roll streamline. Oh, let's let's get into the last one, which is actually with weight, because people ask me, hey, you know, do you lift, bro? So <laughs> this is one of my favorite exercises because it hits almost everything. Uh, exercises that are heavy with um, uh, that promote anti lateral flexion. Um, these exercises are fantastic and cross over into almost every stroke. The suitcase deadlift, this is for lifters. So if you happen, if you do lift weights, this is a great exercise to keep your form honest. And uh, it really helps increase your strength output and uh, being able to keep your core strong and stable throughout these movements because that barbell doesn't lie. <laughs> if you are off a little bit, that bar will move. So you just can't rush your way through it and mask any type of weakness uh, in your kinetic chain with, with, uh, with momentum because momentum definitely will mask any type of weakness in your kinetic chain. So being able to focus on that strength and uh, generate force, stability, uh, increase your technique, your lifting technique for that whole safety and, uh, and uh, scalability and also the sustainability because if something is continually safe, you can always go back to it without injuring yourself. And you can always do that exercise and improve your overall strength. Uh, this is the overhead kettlebell press. I love kettlebells, but this can also be done with a dumbbell as well. And I'll just rewind that. So with the overhead kettlebell press, as you can see in that position, there is no, uh, or there is very minimal, um, any type of movement from my core, I'm keeping it strong, I'm keeping it stable, and then my arm is extended. And you extend your arms in every single stroke. <laughs> and that's where you see a lot of the uh, strength bleed out from swimmers. When they're, when they're trying to pick up their speed, they fishtail, or they could potentially fishtail in freestyle or backstroke, or they dive down into the water for breaststroke or butterfly. But being able to have a strong and stable core and keep your kinesthetic awareness, you need to be able to uh, have the bar stay stable and it is weighted. So this is kind of, is definitely an, an offset lift and offset lifts I love for swimmers as well because it really helps you to stay balanced uh, in the water. If you can balance yourself in this position right here, you'll definitely be able to balance yourself in the water uh, as a swimmer because you, you just make that, uh, you, you can really transfer that knowledge and transfer that experience into the water. So this works for all the this is my favorite these are three of my favorite exercises i have tons more but in this short time frame i just want to just uh, share with the public just a few of my favorite exercises and there are more to come i really appreciate how you're combining different movements there right and it yeah. gives you the opportunity as you say one of your s's is scalable as you start to perform and progress and get more comfortable with these movements you can add an iteration or two or three to make them more interesting and more challenging as they further develop, correct? Correct. And you can just use the same language as swimmers. You don't have to uh, go outside of the ecosystem uh, as swimmers. We can, when you can relate something, relate, relatability and being able to link knowledge uh, really helps you to remember it. And it really helps them, it really helps create that mind-body connection, it strengthens that mind-body connection. 
Atiba, talk to me about how do you find the proper number of reps to begin with? How do you explore that um, in terms of loading from week to week or progressing from week to week? If a coach is just starting some of these exercises, are they durational? Are they number of reps? H how do you kind of scale those? And you have to optimally tailor, tailor it for a specific group. Uh, so my advice first is to focus on form before you start to focus on reps and sets. So form first, optimal form first, and then we go to reps and sets because coaches, this can be used at any point during the season. Uh, you can use it as a warm up. You can use it as, you know, something to do in between sets for conditioning. Uh, and this is great for, for example, if your pool is packed, <laughs> you can, and, and you want to create a dry land swim circuit, these exercises, like for example, dry fly, open turn side arches, these exercises are great to do on the side of the pool. If you have 30 athletes, 10 could be on the side of the pool on one side doing open turn side arches. The other 10 could be on the other side of the pool doing a uh, dry fly and then you have 10 swimmers in the water instead of having 30 swimmers in the water <laughs> that sounds like a Schulberg workout from back in the day <laughs> so yeah you could and, and then if you have two coaches uh, if you have a head coach and assistant coach on deck guess what everyone's getting the attention that they need you know and it's just you know you can have one coach watching the dry land portion of it and the coach can correct the dry land because they speak the language like oh my gosh if they're doing dry fly and they're doing this, you can say, all right, let's get that head down before the arms come around so you can really work on the timing of your stroke. Oh, you need to work on, let's make sure that that arm is, you know, you're elbowing your brother, calling your mother, that, or whatever you want to say, you know, whatever. And there, it, it really diminishes that disconnect. I said this earlier, but uh, one of the big disconnects that come with strength and conditioning uh, is there's a disconnect between the coach and swimmer when they're not speaking the same language, but even more importantly, there is a disconnect between swimmer and performance when everyone isn't speaking the same language. So that's what we want to diminish. That's what we want to get rid of. And for example, this is why anyone can do this. It's safe, it's scalable, and uh, it's sustainable. What, what I liked about what you just said was that you're, you can reinforce correct water technique during the dry land uh, exercise. So like when I watch you, one of the first things I noticed is, and just coach brain turns on is, oh, look, he's really doing a good job there of getting his head down before the hands land. So <laughs> on, on these exercises, you know, when, when you're doing the side arch open turn, if that top arm is going like this instead of like this, you know, we can, we can make those corrections that are applicable to what we do in the water, even though we're not in there. Um, and also, and with that, for example, when I'm working with swimmers, when we're doing dry land before we get into the water, let's say if we're at a fitter and faster clinic and I'm doing a warm up, a dry land workout, warm up before we actually get in the water. And I ask the swimmers to get into streamline. I'm like, okay, I can see what they're going to do in the water. <laughs> we're like, okay, I'm going to watch this person, make sure that they do this in the water because I can see what they're doing now on land. Or if I ask them to go horizontal, or if we're doing a push up in a specific way, a, a certain uh, type of push up, or if we're, I just watch how they move their bodies on land and uh, through some of the exercises that we do. And I'm like, okay, I can see what they're gonna do in the water. And <laughs> it's, it, that's what usually happens. So I can speak to it before we get into the water, I already have it in my mind, or I can just speak to that. And I can speak to the group uh, before we get into the water and they can already, think about that before they get into the water because the proof is in the pudding right there. They're like, oh my gosh, my arms are not in line when I'm doing my streamline. Uh, my back is doing this when I'm in streamline instead of in there, you know, so in, in applying that, uh, applying those moves and infusing stroke mechanics with those dry land moves, it becomes very clear. Fair to say that most of the technical issues that you see, let's say at a fitter and faster swim camp, that you've never worked with these athletes before and you're watching them do some, some streamlines and it could be a 12 and under group. Fair to say that it's the easiest way for athletes to get better at that age group and under is to strengthen their core and have abdominal strength. Abdominal strength overall core strength and being able to um, uh, 
uh, be mobile and having that kinesthetic awareness to be able to uh, hold not just a plank, but being able to potentially do like an inchworm where you're moving forward and you're not seeing that back arch. Because guess what? When you're doing anti-extension exercises such as that and their back arches or they do that, you're going to see that in their streamline. You're going to see that when they extend their body to try to get which to try to optimize their distance per stroke, but they can't achieve that. So it, you'll, you'll see a breakdown in their stroke and, or you'll see when they're trying to extend on their freestyle, that happens. You know, we want some, we want to be able to keep that uh, core nice and tight and extended. And a lot of the anti-rotational exercises that I do, anti-extension, anti-flexion, you know, anti-lateral flexion, all that stuff comes from here. And the, the more, skilled it's a skill uh i'm not just saying talented the more skilled you become at these exercises and the more skilled you become with the uh gaining access to this part of your body and it just it really transfers into everything that you do in the water when i'm at nationals and i have a chance to watch guys like caleb well let's just say caleb off the blocks it is incredible how quickly he moves underwater. Underwater kick was starting to become popular when you and I were younger. And now, if you're not good underwater, you're gonna have a real tough time being successful at a high level. Core mm -hmm. strength, pivotal in underwater kicking. What are some things that are basic that coaches can do to start to use a dry land exercise that's gonna translate to their underwater kicking? All right. One thing that you can do is making sure that, I mean, for example, I have breaststroke feet, <laughs> so I will not, well, I'm saying I will not, but I haven't, it's more challenging for me to be able to uh, maintain propulsion for 15 meters off the wall. My magic number, let's say is like four or five fly kicks, and then I got to come up and start swimming. But one thing that you can do to optimize effect or optimize power output, one thing that simple. You can really just work on, uh, people think about, you know, when we talk about core, we just talk about the abs, but you also, the scapula, being able to make your scapula a lot more mobile because we spend a lot of time doing this. We spend a lot of time doing this, but being able to do scapular exercises like scapular pushups really help to optimally engage and to create that range of motion for the streamline. All right, so start here and work your way down. Uh, that, that's something that you can definitely go to. And once again, it's safe, it's scalable and sustainable. If you can't do it in a plank position, uh, start with your knees, but start with, with your hands and knees on the ground. You can do some cat cow like in yoga. Uh, and then you can scale it upward to, from there. And once you get a little bit more mobility in, in this area, guess what? You can hit a better streamline. And regardless of how many kicks you take uh, to maintain propulsion, you have already optimized the out, your, your output by increasing your mobility in this whole trunk, this whole, <laughs> this whole area, just by going from here to here. You're no longer fighting against your own propulsion that you're, that you're creating through your kick. You're optimizing it. And that's something that you can do that doesn't require weights. This doesn't require a lot of effort. <laughs> you know, you can just really work on that and boom, you become a better swimmer. That's what uh, they call, you know, as you know, that free speed. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to work for it. Free speed. Free speed comes at a price of being either naturally flexible or a lot of time working on becoming more flexible. One thing that you mentioned there was the scapular plane, and I'm I'm glad you walked down that road because we all have those kids in our program, and they might be fast, but we're coming off of the wall like this. Especially, yeah, 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 especially yeah. as we get into, you know, the, the second hundred of a 200, we're starting to come off the wall like this when we want to be up here. So what are some things that kids can do at home? One thing that you suggested to me a while ago, and we're having some athletes do this, is just hanging on their pull-up bars or on the, on the uh, swing set in the backyard, just hanging and just playing around with increasing their flexibility there. Well, yeah, scapular pushing, yeah, yeah. scapular push-ups. You don't even need a bar for that. Scapular push-ups. If you do have access to a jungle gym or you have a little door jam, when you can get one of those things, pick it up on Amazon, whatever, Walmart or whatever uh, sporting goods place, put it in the door, hang, and just 
hang. You can uh, you can do a passive, active hang, passive hang, active hang, passive hang, and also that's great. Hanging also decompresses the spine. It's just there's so many benefits that actually my uh, next week my video that I'll post is going to be about the benefits of hanging, and I'll and I'll do some demonstrating as well. But once again, um, you want to be able to the the objective here. Speed, we know speed is the name of the game, but you want to be able to race and perform with all out technique and having a strong and stable core along with that whole kinesthetic awareness and being able to move your body will allow you to uh, train and to perform with all out technique because there's two things that will affect your technique and they are speed and fatigue. So being able to train and perform with all out technique will help you to optimize your speed. No doubt about it, man. And Atiba, I'm so thankful to uh, have you on today. And I want to finish up a little quick fire like we always do. Uh, these okay. are some different questions. All right. Caleb Dressel, he's on your football team. <laughs> what position would you have him play? Wow. Uh, he could definitely be a wide receiver or a defensive back or, or a safety. I mean, he could be a quarterback. I mean, you know. Man, yeah. So that's, that's yeah, that's my I, answer. I would have I would have him at like a slot receiver or a tight end. You know, like he, <laughs> he could get up and get the ball. He might be able to block a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you know, like just an incredible talent. Uh, Atiba, one of the things that's really evolving in USA Swimming, and I know you're proud of it, is the fact that our sport is becoming more diverse um, and we're really working hard to create some inclusion in our sport. Uh, today, Leah Neal, who I, I watched develop as a young age grouper in Metropolitan, she announced her retirement. Uh, but what do you think are some ways that we can continue to increase our team's diversity and what are some things maybe that coaches should consider when, you know, starting to market for the registration in the beginning of the season? We need to take an approach and I'll say this in the both figurative and literal sense. Uh, we need all hands on deck. <laughs> Everyone needs to do their part and show how this benefits everyone. Um, a high tide raises all boats, but we need all hands on deck when it comes to uh, bringing everyone in. Uh, so what we can, one big thing that we can definitely do is evolve from panels to actually having some really big time financial investment in communities that may be underserved. For example, if Ford, wants to make a better car. They're gonna hire the best engineers, they're gonna hire the best design team, and they're not gonna, and those design people and those engineers, they're not gonna work for free. <laughs> you gotta pay for the best, you gotta pay for what you would pay for where you wanna go. And until we see some more financial investment in, in, in this whole infrastructure. What, we, what we're looking for is, well, what I think needs to happen, there definitely needs to be more financial investment. And uh, for example, if you have Tesla or Ford, any type of car company, if you want to build a better car, if you want to build a better vehicle, you're gonna have to bring in the top minds in the field in order to do that. And you're gonna have to pay them. Um, advisory boards are great. Um, and it does help to push forward the discussion but you know, in order for the, I keep using these uh, <laughs> these sayings, but for the rubber to hit the road, you know, we have to have a top level design team. You have to have a great engineer. You have to have a great, art, you know, uh, person to design the car. So we need a better vehicle, and I think that if you're going to do that, you're going to have to pay for it. So you're going to need some more investment in the vehicle. Put the money where your mouth is, and let's start investing some dollars into this process. No doubt about it. All right, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. I know you're ready for it, but your favorite part of doing clinics for Fitter and Faster is what? Favorite part of doing clinics for Fitter and Faster, being able to actually 
share something that will either introduce, uh, reinforce, or enhance with a swimmer's skill set. And being able to do one of those three things, so when, be, when, when swimmers can walk out of the pool a better swimmer than when they walk in the pool, that is hands down my favorite part. And the way that they do that is making sure that, as I said earlier, it's just being able to do those things. Like one, one, of, one of those three or all three, two of the three, either way, if I can introduce you to a new skill set, reinforce your skill set or enhance your skill set, that is one of my favorite parts of being a part of this fitter and faster uh, swim camp. One thing that I love that you bring to our sport is a passion and enthusiasm for athlete development. And, you know, you just exude that passion and we're so appreciative of the work that you're doing. I can't wait to make some clips of the explanations of some of the work, the uh, workouts that we shared today that you shared. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how many people get excited about it. We're going to have this episode posted all over. It's going to be available Thursday afternoon by 5 p.m. And Atiba, keep up the great work. Thank you for your time today. And I, I look forward to watching where you continue to evolve with this. Well, thanks for having me. And I'm open to talk to you anytime. And as well as anyone who's listening, feel free to hit me up if you have a question. But thanks for having me. Atiba, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, you can just look on my Instagram page, uh, away360, or you can go to my uh, Instagram page, h 2 Fitness or my Facebook, H2Go Fitness, or my Facebook page, Ativa Wade. Those are all great ways to get in contact with me.